Come on, let's South Point. Come on, stand on your feet. Put your hands together. We got a lot to be grateful for, amen? Hey! Seriously though, seriously though, we all have something to be grateful for because we all were headed into sin and destruction until Jesus stepped in, right? Right? Mercy means that he could have rightfully punished you, but he didn't. Instead, he sent you hope. Yeah, go ahead, clap, give him praise. He gave us hope, he gave us life, he gave us liberty. He gave us Jesus, amen? Come on, we're going to read this scripture together. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Now read it. Now you got to read it like you're happy about this, okay? All right, can we, 
Can we read it with some energy? This is the word of life. Come on, come on, come on. All right, here we go. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in mercy. Come on, church. That, that alone should be enough reason for us to praise him. And one of the ways that we, one of the ways that we, that we show our gratitude is through worship. Did you know that? So can we do that? Can we just right now enter in to his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise, by showing our gratitude for every good thing that he's done, for all his mercies, just by singing, by blessing his name. Amen? Amen. Let's sing this together. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Lift your voice and say that to him. Oh, there's nothing yeah. better than you. There's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Well, I searched. I searched the world. But it could have been me A man's empty praise And treasures that fade Are never enough Yeah! Then you came along And put me back together And every desire Is now satisfied
bless his holy name yes everything that's in me bless his holy name be lifted high in our life. May you find worship and thanksgiving in this place. We're so grateful. We're so grateful for everything that you've done. Thank you for your life, for your love, for your mercy, for your kindness, for your salvation, for your adoption. There is nothing better than you are amazing, and we, your children, will worship you. And all the church said, amen. Come on, give them one more praise. serve a good God. Nah, you missed the wrong time. Come on, come on. We serve the good God. There's nobody like him. Amen. Woo. Man, it is good to be here worshiping with you. Hello. Hello. There I am. I'm going to change the order of the service. Come on. Mike and Carla, where are you? The kicks. Okay, come up here. And we're just going to do this right now. So Myra, come here. It's a very special day for us. We're, um, it's a sad day and a beautiful day. So Myra has, Snowden has helped us worship on this stage since 2014. And, um, and she has just been offered a position at our Every Nation Church in Augusta. It's a downgrade, but she's going there. <laughs> You can tell Pastor Brent I said that too. But this is her last Sunday to lead worship on this stage for there. And so Samira will be getting in a car after the holiday and going up to be on staff at In Focus Church in Augusta, Georgia with Pastor Brent and Carla Gerard. So we're happy for her. And then, Mike, how do you spell your last name? Okay, I thought, man, I spelled it wrong. And, uh, and, uh, but, um, but this couple you don't know as well because you never see them, but you actually see them every week. They have, how long have you worked back in the tech department? 13 years. Oh, 13 years, yeah. Yeah, 13 years. And they're some of our very, very best, if not the best we have right now in the tech department. And they've worked for 13 years. But... Mike has a better opportunity, career-wise, is what I understand, something like that. It's a promotion, and so I don't fault him for that. It's a downgrade wherever he goes to church. And, um, but they will be leaving to move to northern Georgia somewhere here this week, 
and or real soon. This will be our last opportunity to say goodbye to them. And we don't, every time somebody leaves that has done something here, we don't have the opportunity to do this, but seven years on this platform leading worship, 13 years running cameras, lights, and everything else in this place, we felt like we needed a moment. So, if you will just lift your hands, we, they have served here in a great way. If you'll lift your hands toward them, and uh, we're going to pray God's blessing on them. Father God, I, I thank you for the kicks and Miss Snowden. I thank you, Lord God, for all that they've been and meant to this church, the countless moments that we've had because of their faithfulness, training, willing, extra hours, extra practices. They've spent so much of their life in this building getting ready for this people. And we are so forever grateful to you, God, for them. And because they have served your people so well here, I pray that the blessings that they have earned will follow them to their new career, to their new place of worship. God, I pray that they find favor there and blessing there and friendship there and prosperity there. I pray Samira's husband is there. Sorry. And then she'll bring him back faithfully because that's the only reason she's going. Go get that man and bring him back in Jesus' name. Everybody said. Amen. Yeah, you heard that right there. Father, thank you for Mike and Carla, for Samira. It's what it takes to build a great church. It's this kind of people right here. Not me. Not me, Lord. This kind of people. That's what it takes. And I pray that they will find a church home in favor and blessing as a result of all they've done here. Protect them, preserve them. We want to see them often and especially in glory together. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you give them another great hand for all their service? Hallelujah. I will turn it over to Pastor Tyler. Love you guys. Bye. Well, I'll see you after lunch. I'll see you at lunch, won't I? I'll hug you twice. Then. God is good, amen? Um, how we want to start this morning is how Pastor Rush usually starts his sermons. Are there any believers of Jesus in the house today? Come on, y'all strong with that today. All right, we wanna start with our Connect card. Uh, if you guys can pull out your phones, our online Connect card is there, it's on the app. Uh, you can go to our church website, southpointcc.com, or if you don't have either of those, just text my SCC to 484848, and we will, get that sent that, we will get that sent over to you. If you're online with us, we're just gonna post the link in the comments right there, so you can just click on that. But our Connect card is just a great opportunity for us to take a next step with the church, whether you're a, a new attender or you've been attending here for 13 years like the Kicks family has been. Um, we just wanna know that you're here and we wanna help you co to continue to walk in your relationship with God. At the bottom of our Connect card, we have a prayer portion. We've been praying as a staff, pastoral staff, for your prayers every uh, once a week. Um, it's really been cool to see how God is moving in your life, so share that with us, prayer requests, praise reports that you have. Also, if you have recently made a decision for Jesus, what we want, what we want to encourage you to do is as you leave today, as you go out to the doors to your right, next to the, uh, the men's restroom area over by the front right door, there's an I have decided table. Um, and it's just to celebrate you and your relationship with Jesus. Um, and it's gonna be there. We have a gift for you. We wanna encourage you. We wanna pray with you and believe that God has amazing things for your life. That's right there for you as you walk out today, the I Have Decided table. Another next step that you can take this summer is the Grow Track. Raise your hand if you've heard us mention the Grow Track. Um, the Grow Track has been amazing. 
Uh, if you have not taken it, start it this summer. If you're new in our church, start it this summer. If you've been here for 10 years, start it this summer. The Grow Track is a great place for you to get involved, to learn more about our church, more about yourself, to more about who God has called you to be. We do not have Grow Track today. It's usually right after service. We don't have Grow Track today because it's the fifth Sunday. We do it the first four Sundays. So next week, first week, first Sunday in June, we will start that back up. So get that online connect card filled out for us. Take those next steps, and let's believe that God has amazing things for us this summer. Um, well, I'm the youth pastor, and this summer we have some amazing plans for our youth group. Uh, in the month of June alone, it's going to be amazing. So this upcoming weekend, Friday and Saturday, we have our high school youth summit. And it is going to be incredible. We're gonna have hundreds of students right here from our church and another Every Nation church from Lake Mary coming up here. And so if you have a student, or if you are a student that is coming into high school through a senior year in high school, we wanna invite you to be there. It's $70, get signed up today if you haven't already. Um, we just are believing that God is going to use this summit to change the students in our church change the students in our movement and in our city. And don't you guys wanna be a part of that? Man, I do. I wanna be a part of that. We've been praying, fasting, believing that God's gonna move. So please, do something different with your child this summer. Get them to the Youth Summit. Uh, a couple weeks after that, we have our Band of Brothers trips. This is for all of our middle school and high school young men, our rising seventh graders through our seniors. It's for the students and their dads. Um, this is the best thing we do for the guys in our trip. We go up to Sanding Indian Mountain in North Carolina. We t we, there's no electricity, we're not on our phones. And really the main thing we're doing on this trip is we're helping our young men learn what it means to be a man of God. That's what the trip is all about. And in today's day and age, what the world is saying masculinity is and what it means to be a man, man, I don't know of something more important for our youth group than this trip. Um, so go to southpointcc.com, click on events, uh, guys, you want to get there. Dads, we would love for you to come as well. It's just going to be an amazing time where we can get away and believe for God to move and try not die going up this crazy mountain hiking. Oh, help us, Lord. Um, then the last thing we have in June is our Flourish trip at the Springs. The girls are going to go to the Itchituckney Springs. Um, they're really excited about that. And so uh, Miss Kaylee, my wife, is going to be taking the girls right around the end of June for a three-day trip to the Itchituckney Springs. And what I want you guys to hear as a church body, because, you know, not all of you have students or are a student. It's only a small percentage. What I want you to hear as a church is we really care about the next generation. It's really, really important that we are invested in that we as a church are young. And so I want to show you guys we're going after the students of this city. Amen? And we want us to be a part of that. So so thank you. Uh, thank you so much for being here today, for joining us. Students, get signed up for those amazing things we have this summer. And let's get ready for a great word from Pastor Russ. Love you guys. Thank you, Tyler. All right. Join me in a word of prayer, if you would. Father God, I uh, ask you for open eyes, open ears, that revelation would pour into every man and woman's heart in this room. To those that are found, that are yours, I pray that new light would come in, that they'd be awakened out of an amnesia that overtakes us all too easy today, and we remember that which maybe we've forgotten. For those, Lord God, who don't know you today, that are here for all kinds of different reasons, I pray that the light of revelation would come on inside of their heart and they'd know Jesus. Because that's the only miracle, Lord God, that will get them there, is that the Jesus of biblical revelation makes himself known in their heart. And I pray that you would glow brightly in them. Father, I pray for an anointing on this moment that my words would be you are very oracles and that they would be like a pen in the hands of a skillful writer yes. as they write on the minds and hearts of your people. I pray for no wasted moments. I pray for every opportune moment. I pray this becomes a Kairos moment. Yes. That Holy Jesus, you have your way in all of our lives today as we remember you. We love you so much. We thank you for our church. We thank you for our friends, our family. Thank you for saving us, yes. keeping us. We're so grateful today. With that gratitude, we come before you and sit at your feet to hear your word. Help us, Jesus. In your name.
And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Turn to Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. Uh, you can use the screens. Um, great to see all of you here on Memorial Day uh, weekend. Uh, as, you, as we've told you, we're going to each week we're going to keep watching to see what the summer does and how the summer holds and hopefully have a few weeks together, first and second service together in one. And, um, and uh, so we'll just take it week by week. So pay attention. It's kind of like COVID rules. Pay attention to us until we're uh, and uh, every week go online and go, you know, better make sure church is when they said it was. And uh, because it's the only way we can serve you well. So just help us with that while we try to figure it all out. Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. <clears throat> My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I reject you from being a priest to me. And since you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. On February the 9th, 1974, I walked out of First Assembly of God Church, Rockford, Illinois, a married man. I was 18 years old, and my amazing bride was 18 years old. We were mature. We had everything figured out in life ahead of most people, so we decided, heck, we might as well get married. So here we were, 18, so we left uh, the reception and drove to Lake Geneva, Wisconsin to celebrate our honeymoon over the weekend because we only had so much vacation time in the factories that we worked in, and we were saving our one week that we had left to go to a seminar, Institute in Basic Youth Conflicts in Chicago, Illinois. So we saved our vacation to go attend this seminar where we were going to learn more about Jesus, more about his word and how to live life. So we only had the weekend, so we went to Lake Geneva and spent the weekend there and then returned home to our 600 square foot cinder block house that we later bought for $10,000. Bought that house for $10,000. And, um, uh, and we just continued our honeymoon there. And life was amazing. We were just bliss. Nine days into our honeymoon, because Debbie loved to cook. So, I mean, right out of the gate, every night I'd come home from work. I was working the day shift. I'd come home, and, man, she'd come home, and it would be this amazing meal. I mean, she was showing out. And I was loving every minute of it. I was thin once. All of what is left of me now is her fault, and, and I've enjoyed every minute of it. And, um, and so I sat down on... The 18th of February at my meal, and it was an amazing meal as normal, except there was something new. There were flowers on the table. So I started eating the meal and eating right along, and, and um, all of a sudden I noticed the flowers. I said, man, those, where'd you get the flowers? What, what's, who gave those to you? And she got up from the table, hysterical, in tears, said somebody's name I can't remember to this day, gave them to her, for her birthday. She ran out of the room and threw herself on the bed, which wasn't very far away in our house. It's like three steps and you were there. You know, you left the kitchen table, you jumped on the bed. That's kind of how it went. And, um, and she's just in there just crying face. And I go, oh my, I only nine days into the marriage and I've forgotten the first birthday and, um, and so in my opinion I've never been forgiven for that <laughs> and I know that uh, uh, some of you husbands have to understand I know they have read the scriptures on forgiveness they don't quite understand the application they will tell you they have forgiven you, but they really have not forgiven you because it comes back several years over the time. It was like the time you forgot my birthday. I thought I, thought I was forgiven for that. You were. I just remember. <laughs> Any man know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So I was in the doghouse, which I later named the Russ house because I was there so often. So I cleaned it up the best I could. I ran out, bought some flowers, and, and uh, did everything I could to make up. And, 
And I, and I just say that story. There's just certain things you're not supposed to forget. There's certain things that you're not supposed to forget because if you forget, they're going to be costly. That is the theme of this message today. There are certain things God will tell you, do not forget this. Because if you forget this about me, it will not go well with you. Don't forget, it's really important. Now, what Hosea is telling us is that God's people had intentionally moved away from him and in the process of not drawing close to him, living with intentionality to come into his presence, they developed amnesia to his law. By not doing what he had told them to do to remember, they had come to a place of total forgetfulness and no longer even could remember what his law said. The result of that was that they were going to be removed in their relationship from Jesus to a much different place and that their children were going to suffer as a result of it. He said God was going to punish their children. No, the parents punished the children because God removed the children, I mean, the people removed the children from the application of his law. He said, that's not going to go well with your children. And he said, because you forgot me, I'll forget them. Quite a statement. You don't hear that part of that verse as often. God knows we have a memory problem. There, there are certain things, I don't know if this went on the screen already, but there are certain things about God and what he has done that we cannot forget. If we do, it will be costly. It'll be costly. Um, he knows God knows we have a memory problem. You know that. He knows we have a memory problem. He knows we can't remember all things at all times. And, uh, and we, we can't command all those scriptures to come back at the right time. That's why he gave us the Holy Spirit, but that's a whole other message. But he does know we have a memory problem. He knew when he was leading his people Israel, which later, are, in my opinion, are a type of who we are, and, um, and now we, when you look at what happened with Israel, you should look at your own life. Studying Israel and God is like studying you and God. And, uh, and, and so he said, I'm going to help you by giving you a national calendar and putting events on it that I want you to do every year so that you don't forget. He said, it's mandatory that you get to, your whole family comes to this one. All the men come to this one. Everybody comes to this one. These people come to this one. But every year on the calendar, the whole nation of Israel was to show up for these events. And um, there's several of them. I'm not going to go into all of them. I'm going to give you two examples of them this morning. The first one is in Leviticus chapter 23, verses 23 through 25. I'll give you a second to get there if you're using your Bible. Leviticus 23, and the rest of you, it'll be on the screens. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall observe a day of solemn rest, a memorial proclaimed with a blast of trumpets. Hang on, let me get a drink. A holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work, and you shall present a food offering to the Lord. Now notice, in verse 24, He says, this day is a memorial. It's a memorial. All right, we're going to come back to that. So there is what we call the Feast of the Trumpets. I'll explain that in a second. Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. So back up a few books to Exodus chapter 12, verses 2 through 7, and then verses 13 and 14. He says about this particular moment, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat, and you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male a year old. You, shall, you may make it from sheep or from the goats. And you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. 
Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. And you're going, I don't, what about all this stuff? Just, no, this was a very important, because this is the Passover. All right, then down to verse 13. The blood on the doorpost shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So we know that's what took place. This day shall be for you a what? Memorial Day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations, as a statute forever, you shall keep it as a feast. So the, he said, not only was the first Passover to be celebrated a certain way, you were to replicate that annually on this date from now and evermore, or until that which would fulfill this existed. And who fulfilled this? Jesus, Jesus did. Jesus fulfilled this so that we no longer, we don't honor, we honor, you know, there are people that still do it in Jewish circles and that, and, um, but we don't celebrate the Passover as a special moment. Every day is Passover for us right now. Amen. And Jesus, and amen? All right, so the celebration of the Passover and the solemn assembly called the trumpets, was called the trumpets, were two of these annualized events. And um, that Israel was mandated to attend. Now, they were made to come and do that so that they would remember something. It wasn't about the present day. It was to take you back to that day and remind you of why this day was here in the first place. Are you clear on that? It's real important. Because we tend to celebrate a day and not remember that the day was about something to remember. So we might have burgers and everything tomorrow and have fun and watermelon and ice cream, but it is a day that we celebrate, but it is also a day to remember something very, very important. All right, so same thing with these religious holidays, the Passover feast called in the remembrance, the night that God passed over the houses that had obeyed this, in, these instructions and put blood on their doorposts, and then whenever the destroying angel came through, he passed over every home that had the blood on the doorpost. Everybody else who had a firstborn child lost them. All right? And uh, that didn't do that. And he said, I passed over you. So to celebrate his mercy and his grace, they would do the Passover feast every year, honoring the lamb that died and the blood that was shed to give freedom and victory and eternal life to those who were covered by it which would be me and you. The Feast of Trumpets, or Rosh Hashanah, if you see it on your calendar sometimes, reminded the people that they must enter the new year with humility, repentance, and putting their trust in him for delivering them from the ramifications of sin. Not going to go into a big talk on the Feast of the Trumpets. It was a one-day event. It was a fast. Uh, there were, it was kind of a partial fast. There were certain foods you could eat, a lot of foods you couldn't. There were different things. A big trumpet blast would come out of the ram's horns, and it was kind of the announcement of a new year and that you would come in with humility, repentance, and seeking after God for blessing in the coming year. And, um, but it was to be done every year, and what you were to remember was this. As we go into the new year, I have sin that God is covering, and I'm looking for God to bless this coming year. But you go back and remember. And it's not about you, it's about Him. Now, a memorial is supposed to take you back to something significant in history that must not be forgotten. So what are the two? Forgotten. You're, you get saved by the passing over of, of sin in your life through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Amen. He shed his blood. You surrender to that. Put your faith in that. You have eternal life. We go back to the cross to celebrate that. Amen? Amen? Amen. Communion is a memorial. The Lord's table is a memorial. For the record, on a lesser fashion, Sunday church is a memorial. Where God goes, you have a very short memory, so every seven days gather. But just taking those two to go forward, because there's some things I want to talk about that you're going to feel like I made a hard, a hard right hand turn here, but I think you'll figure it out as we go along. Because I want to take the rest of the time that you're giving me to talk which I know some of you are going, I ain't giving you any more time. Quit. <laughs> and uh, so I'm going to take a little bit more time to talk about two memorial moments that I think are important to us today because there's a bunch in Scripture. 
One is our national call to remember those who gave their lives in combat on behalf of our country. Very important way I say those words. On behalf of our country. Number two, the second thing I want to talk about is in the scriptural mandate to remember Jesus by the regular taking of the Lord's table. All right. First, I want to look at Memorial Day for a second. Just Memorial Day National now. All right, and uh, uh, it, Memorial Day started as a thing called Declaration Day right after the Civil War. It, was right, it didn't exist before then. It was right after the Civil War. Many people went out to celebrate those in, that had died. It, it was our most deadly war. I think it was 655,000 estimated died in the Civil War. It's horrifying. Our country was much smaller then. So it was a large part of the male population disappeared. And... Um, and it was very deadly, and a lot of people were glad it was over and honored those who fought. And so they would go out, and they decorated graves. Um, one of the most, it's undocumented, so it's a little bit unsure. A lot of people are sure it happened. I don't know. But there's one where there was a, a stadium, of some kind of stadium in a city. I forget the name of the city. And uh, there was a large mass grave that had been dug for Union soldiers and in order to stop the disease, because the bodies were rotting in that, they just had to. They didn't, they didn't want to, but they had to put them in this giant pit and cover them up because of the disease and everything that was going on because they couldn't bury them fast enough. They couldn't find their families fast enough. So they just threw them in this giant pit and mass burial and covered them up. And it said that um, uh, at that particular site, over 1,000 slaves, ex-slaves, came and decorated that grave, thankful for the men who had died, for them to have freedom. But it's a bit undocumented. We don't have it, so there may be some untruth to that. I don't know. I hope it's true. I hope it's true. And, um, but there are other things that are true. Immediately, people started going out to the cemeteries where they did know where their loved ones were, and they would decorate the graves. And so every year, it was in May the 5th in the beginning, they would go out on May the 5th and decorate the graves of those who'd fought. And it grew over time because then there were more wars. So all the great wars. And uh, some people have added the Revolutionary War, <clears throat> um, but there's the Civil War, World War I, World War II, Korean War, Vietnam War, and all the Middle East Wars. I didn't mention the War of 1812 or the Mexican-American War. And, um, and so I, 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 all of those wars, the great wars were fought. And since then, on Memorial Day, we have gone out to decorate their grave or to honor those that died in combat on behalf of their country. I'll explain why I keep emphasizing that in a minute. And, um, uh, and then it moved around and got in different dates and different things and then finally moved to the end of May and then finally because of the, what, I forget the name of it, the Unification Act of Holidays <laughs> that federally, federal holidays would always be on a Monday so that federal employees could get three days off. I think that was in 1971. And uh, good for the federal employees, happy for them. And uh, we all get three-day weekends for them. We got something out of them. And, uh, and so, and, uh, but, uh, and so, <clears throat> Um, but we, um, uh, it, it, so it's, it's quite a thing to think about. And so ever since then, we have honored on Memorial Day those who died in combat on behalf of the United States. The reason I keep saying behalf is because if I went around this room, several of you wouldn't agree on some of the wars we fought in. You would not. There would be people here saying we shouldn't have been in that war. That's America. In America, you have the right to stand up and say, I don't agree with something and not go to jail. Right. Or you used to. You, you didn't lose your job because you stood up and disagreed with something in America till recently. And you could be dead wrong and stand up and disagree with it vehemently. And people would disagree with some of the wars that I just, we shouldn't have been there, we shouldn't have been there, we shouldn't have been there, we shouldn't have sent them to that battle, we shouldn't have done that. So these young men... If they could hear you from their grave right now, would say, well, then I didn't die for any good reason on your, to, as far as you're concerned. That was the great horror of coming home from the Vietnam War. Anybody come home from the Vietnam War? Any of you guys? You know that, what that felt like. But these young men didn't go over because they hated the Vietnamese or the Koreans or the Germans or the Russians. They went over on behalf of their country. 
They were following orders. They were doing what militaries do. And so you can disagree with these wars, and I'm not sure I'd agree with all of them, but I certainly agree with men who took their orders and went and fought on behalf of their country because without them, we get nowhere. So before I get emotionally and angry and say other things, it, it, it just is so important that we understand how important these people are. And I hope this weekend we take just a little bit of time to reflect on the sacrifices others have made. I'm having all of my families coming over and a bunch of people and we're having hamburgers and hot dogs and water slide and badminton and we're just going to party on. But I'm going to take some time in the morning to say thank you, Lord, for those young men and women that were willing to go and take their orders because I sure have a great life over here because of them. And uh, I know a lot of folks don't like America right now, but I still love it as much as I ever did, and I'm not afraid to say it. I know, I'm a white evangelical, and then I'm old, and um, so I know. So let me tell you what I've learned a little bit in recent history, is America's not as pretty as I thought. Not as pretty as I thought, not as clean as I thought. Of course, I never really thought we were all that clean. I think we've had some issues in history. Anybody agree with that one? I think we've done some things really wrong. I think there's some wars we should not have gone into. I think slavery was horrifying. I think that we used Jim Crow to make sure the Constitution didn't work for a group of people is ugly. I think what we did to women in the early years is terrible. It's in my American family tree. So what I do is what I think about with the nation is what I think about with my own life. Is that I should read the scriptures and repent and self-correct. And then God forgives me. But then tells me where reconciliation needs to be made, make it, son. Where you need to do some reparation, do it, son. That's how I walk with other people. That's how God calls me to walk as a man, not to be perfect. He wants me to be perfect. He wants you to be perfect. You ain't. And I'm worse. Our nation's not perfect. Come on. We got some ugly stuff. If we're a person as a nation, our family tree's got some nasty stuff in it. But you know my personal Austin family tree's got some nasty stuff in it. I sure hope by repentance, by surrender, by confession of sin, by reparation and reconciliation, by love walking forward that I am not doomed to what my past was in my family tree, but I am doomed to what that Word of God says that I can be, and I believe the same thing for my nation. So I think there's some lessons we could learn to, from all of this, um, of these young men and women that have died in combat on behalf of their country. And I'm thankful because I, I love where I live. I love that somebody right now can take a clip of me, what I just said, put it on Facebook and run me into the ground. That's America. That's the privilege of America. Play away. You don't shut up and neither will I. It's America, it's what we get to do. Somebody died for us to have that right. So here's some lessons. 
Number one on the screen, anything truly great is initiated, grown, and sustained by great sacrifice. Each one of these is a sermon, so I am completely, incredibly dangerous right now. (laughs) Anything truly great is initiated, grown, and sustained by great sacrifice. There's no other way to have a great marriage, no other way to great children, no other way to have great friendships, no other way to have a great company, no other way to have a great city, no other way to have a great church. There's nothing in life that is great that can be accomplished without great sacrifice. If you didn't pay much for it, it probably ain't any good. So just know this. You say, well, I don't know why all those sacrifices have to be made. Because we're trying to do something great. Greatness demands sacrifice. It's just the way it is. You can not want it to be that way all you want. Go win the lottery. You're one out of 20 million. The rest of us, 19,999,000 of us have to do it by great sacrifice. Number two, the greatness of your cause. However great that cause is, whatever you have determined your cause is for living, what you're supposed to do with your life, the level of it, the size of it, maybe it's better than the greatness, the size of your cause will determine the narrowness of your path. The, the, more, the, the greater the thing that you want to attempt to do with your life, the more narrow your life becomes. Good. Say, I want to do this. Well, then you're not going to be able to do this, 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 or this then. I want to do this too. Well, then you're not going to be able to do this, this, and this, and this. But I want to be really gay. Oh, well, then we need to add some things because the path is getting narrow. You don't do this, this, or this either. And you don't do this, this, or this either. The path to life is narrow, Jesus said. The path that leads to a crazy, destructive life of just kind of hanging out and dying is wide. Everybody's doing that one because it's easy. You can do anything you want. You can do this for a while. You can do that for a while. You can do this. You can explore over here. You can do this. You can do anything you want. It's just at the end of your life, you got nothing great. The size of your cause determines the narrowness of your path. I remember the first time I ever heard it, I don't know whoever started it, but Lester Summerall is the one I heard say it. And he would look at us and he'd go, you want something great in life, boys? And we'd, yeah. He goes, just remember this line. Others may, but you may not. He said, there'll be stuff in life that's not even a sin. You can't do it. There'll be stuff that other people get to do and enjoy it, and God's not even unhappy, but not you. Because the size of your cause determines the narrowness of your path. Number three, you cannot pass on a value you are unwilling to die for. You want your children to have your values? You, you, you want me to really be pastoral and practical? When you're going to church with your kids two times a month, you just told them that all it takes for you to step away from church is be tired. You turned it in, I don't want to hear another one of Russ's sermons, or I don't have to go to church today. You got a line of excuses a mile long. Just know this, when your children stay home with you, you can't pass on their need to go to church because you weren't willing to die for it. You know, when you're dating somebody, single people, you know, I, think, I know you think we forget you all the time. We're about to do a family series. You're going to be like, super forgotten. <laughs> so why should you come to church here? Why should you go through six weeks of a family series? You know, you're single. Why should you come? I don't know. Why should you? Is it your church? Are there families here? And we do know that we need to spend some time talking to you, too. But you'll send 
a value statement to people. It goes my way or I don't go. I hope you're here. I hope you're here. But we do know we got to take care of you too. That Everybody here is not married and you're amazing. And you're building our church. I don't know, you're probably all over the room, but a bunch of them hang out there, so I'm doing there. But the rest of you, you just thought you were off the hook. I'm pointing at you too. Wherever you are, you're very important to us. Very important. But you know, like when you're dating, and then the relationship can move into a physical, and you want a value of holiness and chastity and trust to follow you into marriage. You better be willing to die for it now. You want that value to follow you to your marriage? You better die for it now. I could just do this all day long. Number four. The modern world, this world that we're in right now, must embrace the lessons of the past or lose all its gains by a slow erosion from behind. The modern world must embrace the lessons of the past or lose all of its gains by the slow erosion from behind. <clears throat> this is why having a memory is so important. You have to go back and have ways of remembering certain things so that you don't forget where you've gained and hold on to it. As you move on to new revelation and new truth, and there's certain things you have to go back, but this has got to hold. And holding on to something that you learned a long time ago is, can be a little bit boring. Not nearly as interesting as something new. But you gotta know that if you allow boredom and discomfort and awkwardness with that thing that doesn't drive that new emotion and that newness up inside of you and inspire you, that you're actually losing. Because as you forget the gains and you make the new gains, erosion is following you from behind. That is America right now. That's a lot of Christian lives. I'm going, no, you should have held on to that. Certain things you go do over and over and over. You do them for your whole life. You memorialize certain things. You go, I'll never forget that. I'll never stop being that. But we're a, we're a culture. We, I, I, when I say we, I mean I'm in this one. I, I came up in the generation. Maybe did this more than any generation ever. And um, so I came up with all the hippies and all those folk. The super iconoclast, destroy every, anything that looks like a rule, anything that looks like tradition. And gosh, God, hey, young people, watch out for that one. When they start going, <clears throat> oh, that's tradition. Some of that tradition is timeless truth, not man-made religion. When people start going, it's man-made religion, is there biblical tradition in it? Yes. And if there's biblical tradition, you've got to be smart enough to not let the enemy trick you into throwing out the thing that you need to succeed in life by calling it man-made religion. You've got to sort through it all. Some of it is man-made religion, gang. Some of it is. And man-made tradition is, is evil and it works against truth, but it's not all that. <clears throat> Let me, I'm going to put a giant list. I actually have no idea. I told Debbie, I cannot get this screen off my mind. I have no idea what I'm going to do with it. This is a speaker's nightmare right now. But I want to show you something that I think about all the time and then close this message up. All right, so here's the screen. I don't know how they did it, so I, I got to look at it for the first time myself. So just, can you just put them all down? Just, can you just drop them all in there? So I started writing down things that I think we have to keep remembering. 
in them. I think underneath there's four or five more, but just leave them right there. We'll go to, yeah, show us that one. Now, now go back to the first screen. Yeah, thank you. So I just started writing things down that I see disappearing. Manners. I, I wasn't taught manners. Mom, I'm sorry if you see this message, but you didn't. My mom just told me, don't ever embarrass me when you go to other people's house. <laughs> so I guess that was manners. But nobody told me, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. Nobody taught me Mr. or Miss. I was taught to shut up when I was in the presence of adults. I know we're thinking that's not right, but it's right. You know when they come crashing up into your conversation? You just pop down there and go, you see me talking to Mr. Austin? You see that? Uh-huh. Well, then that means you ain't. No, I think you should be sympathetic with them. They don't know little things. They're not real bright. <laughs> Mine are on the front row. And uh, so <laughs> they're socially challenged sometimes. So that we help them. Yeah. Yeah. Not get mad at them. Anyhow, manners, hospitality, homes that are open for people, civil responsibility. Oh, responsibility. Sorry, that'd be me, I think. And uh, I'm blaming it on that department, though. See, Mike, you've only been gone one day, and it's already falling apart. <laughs> Civility. Oh, my gosh. Civility. Respect for authority. Holding government accountable. You're going, what is that, Russ? I, you know the government's accountable, right? right. It's called voting. Yeah. They're accountable. But no one's paying any attention because we're, we're a little bit lazy. But they're, they're to be held accountable. That's part of the beauty of America. We can hold our politicians accountable. Yes, we can. Go vote them out. That's what we can do. He said, which one's Russ? You'd love for me to do that, wouldn't you? <laughs> You'd love that, wouldn't you? Half of you would. <laughs> Chivalry, man. There'd be so much less talk about what's wrong with men if there was chivalry. Honoring parents. I know every parent's not honorable. But that's something God wants you to have so that you honor all authority. Jesus before country. Can I talk about that for a second? Jesus before country. Listen, I have never put America in front of Jesus and never will. We will always put that flag on the stage of a federal or national holiday to remind ourselves to pray for America, but we do not think America is the new Israel. Does everybody hear me out there? We do not think America is the new Israel. You want to know who the new Israel is? The church of the living God. The born-again Christians that have surrendered to Jesus. That is the new Israel, not another nation. So we've never thought that. Never have that even crossed my mind. There are times when I pledge allegiance to do this, I feel kind of weird. So I always figure out, wait, this is why I'm going to pray for America, because I don't pledge allegiance to anybody but Jesus. I understand what they mean by it, so I do it. But more, I'm clear on what I think they mean. My allegiance is to Jesus first and foremost. So if my country goes against him, I'm against them. You understand? Uh, and you say against like you're going to fight them? No, I'm going to prophetically speak to them with a lifestyle and a preaching that says something to them that they need to repent, humble themselves, change, and serve God. That's what we're called to do as a church. And so I, I oh, that's me. So I put Jesus before country. I don't put America before. I don't, I, I, we have a lot of things wrong with us. And I need to be able to speak to those things that are wrong. If I think America is some hyper-Christian nation, then all of a sudden I'm going, well, I can't speak to it then. The only reason it holds any auspice at all of Christianity is because the church speaks to it. The Bill of Rights, the Constitution of the United States, put me, 
and um, the Ten Commandments. How great are those, the last six of those? Are you kidding me for American government? Let's stop stealing. Let's stop lying. Let's stop coveting our neighbor's wife. Come on now. Those are good laws. The Bill of Rights are amazing. The Ten Commandments are amazing. The Great Commandment and the Golden Rule to do the Shema. I do it every day before I put my feet on the ground. When I get up and get ready, I fall to my knees and I do that. I will love the Lord God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and I will love others as myself. My second part of my prayer, I said, use me, O oh God, today to inspire one, reach one, and make one. Today I said to inspire many, reach many, and make many because I'm up here. Then I say, God, I want to live with you face to face in holy fear that I might be anointed and have authority in my life. I don't move a day without doing that, what I just did. And then there's a long list of things, and I just wondered all of those things because all of that exists in the country in which I live, and I am so, so happy about it. And those that have died to preserve the kind of country where these things could even be possible deserve our honor and our grace. I'm not going to have family stay in who lost somebody. I just want you to remember, tomorrow morning when you get up, would you please take a few minutes, go stand in your front yard, do something, put a flag up on your house, and do it because they died. Don't forget. I do have to say one emotional thing that I'm not sure if I'll regret. I won't regret it, but I just don't want you to go through anything because of me. But I wish these people who say they hate America now could have an audience with the nearly 1.5 million men and women who died on behalf of their country and could just sit in a room with that in a stadium with a microphone and go, let me tell you why I hate America and hear what happens. Don't hate America, fix it. Fix it. We're salt and light. Let's fix it. Everybody still with me? Usually I say email me, please don't. (laughs) All right, Kurt, help me finish. It's my opinion that the greatness of America is directly connected to the impact the church has on its moral life. That's why I put all those up there. I'm not sure what I want to even do with it. I just want, I think about all those things all the time. I, I don't think politics is our first move. I don't even know if it's our second, third, or fourth, or how far down. I don't know how much politics can do. I, I think they have a place. Don't get me wrong. I, I actually think politicians and politics have a place. I hope we get more and more quality people in places of influence. But I, I, I don't think it's the answer because it doesn't do anything to heal the human heart. And most of the politicians right now are trying to fix problems that are problems of the human heart. It is the preaching and living out of the gospel in such powerful ways that people that encounter it are drawn into a saving, uh, saving relationship with Jesus in a sco- corresponding way of life that is directed by biblical revelation. Amen. That's our hope. That's why I love South Point Community Church. Because we're the hope of the city. Amen. And if we want to preserve what men and women have died for, we'll begin here. You want to honor the death of the people who died on behalf of their country? Preach this gospel. Live this gospel. Be this gospel. Bring people into its gospel presence. See their lives transformed by the glory of his presence and his power. That's our great hope. I'm going to save the last point for after this prayer in the offering, and I'll make one last point. Father God, we do remember, it's the best we know how to remember that there are a lot of people who died on behalf of this country. And we live in a place where we can preach freely, worship freely. We can even contend with one another freely. We can own our own homes, have our own firearms, We have laws that protect our properties. 
I believe a lot of this, Lord, is because Scripture has informed the people of days gone by. We have so many privileges and opportunities and blessings because we live in the United States of America. But Lord, I will, in front of the people that I lead, be the first to say, we sure have a lot to repent of all the time. We sure have made a lot of really, really serious mistakes. God, may we be quick to repent, quick to correct, quick to honor you so that we don't lose these privileges. May we not be the people of Hosea that intentionally moved away from the things of God till they forgot his laws and then found out that we weren't even in a good relationship with you in a priestly fashion anymore and that our children were living under a curse because you're forgetting them because we forgot you. God, help us to do better on this Memorial Day. Help us to be a great church, to win the lost, to make disciples, to have a value for the church that we're willing to die for. That God, our path might become a little more narrow because today our cause grows a little greater. Help us, Jesus. Help us, Lord. You know how we struggle. Bless this great people. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I uh, want to receive the Sunday morning tithes and offerings. I know a lot of you are wondering about how we're doing on the family park. We're going to wait till June the 13th to actually say where we are because we have to collect people because everybody's everywhere right now and online. And uh, we're doing good, and, um, but uh, we need to do better. So I'll say that. We, over the next few weeks, we need to make... Everybody needs to get in the game. That's the one thing I want to say about this is I really want every family to be a part of this, not just to get more money. I really want you to say I was part of the South Point family part. So if you haven't yet, if you're just saying no, then that's your privilege. Or if you're saying I'm totally unable, then that is understandable. Any other reason, I'm thinking you should really try to help us, that you should be a part of this. You can make your commitment. You know how. You go on the, um, the uh, PayPal, or not PayPal, uh, push pay. Which one is it? The app? The website. The website. And the website will, <laughs> Jason always goes, Russ, I told you that nine times. And, um, and, uh, but, and it will lead you into where you can make your pledge. There's cards in the seats right in front of you. Oh, let's do that. <laughs> so you can text pledge to 484848. Uh, to make your pledge. It's an 18-month commitment. Um, you can fill out your pledge card and drop it in the offering box. There's one in the uh, chair back right there in front of you. Um, and the online audience, obviously, the link is in your chat. So looking to you to do that also. So anyhow, just want to encourage all of you to really make that decision and be a part of this. And on the 13th, we'll tell you where we stand. And, um, and we'll be glad to do that. But this morning, let's receive the regular Sunday tithe and offering. Um, you have three ways to give there. You can use the app online, obviously, or in person. Same thing. Only on that one, you would text SCC or South Point CC to 484848. So it's all these different numbers and things. It's like you've got to be a computer up here to do that. So I appreciate your faithfulness. Amen? So if you'll prepare yourself to give, let's pray over this offering. Father God, thank you for the privilege of giving. Thank you, Lord God, for those that are considering their commitment. I pray that you'll move on their hearts powerfully and they'll be a part. Bless this offering to meet every need and bless every giver in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Now, um, this is the last point and we're done. Because this, we're almost done with this too. I'm trying to figure out when we're going to stop this, the way we're doing communion. Because I personally don't like these little things. These, these are... COVID friendly, weird little ways of doing communion. They feel so unholy to me. And, um, and so, but if anyhow, if you'll get your little pack and get your wafer from the top and then open up the cup, then I want to say something to you. Be careful with it now. And um, I want to read a scripture to you. 
because this is a memorial. Now, here's, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray with all of us for just a second, but I want to say it real quickly. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'm going to pray a prayer with everybody. And I want you in your chair right there to pray and say, Jesus, it's time for me to make you Lord. Because I'm telling you something that happened in history. And you'll be responsible for that knowledge. You won't be able to forget it. God is not going to go, oh, you forgot. I'm, I get it. No, you can't forget this. Because the basis for your eternity is what you believe about what Jesus did when he gave this way for his body and shed his blood, the cup, on that cross for your sin so that you might have eternal life. And if you're ready to make Jesus Lord of your life today, when I pray this prayer, I want everybody in this room to pray this simple prayer, but I want you to pray it with all your heart. So follow me, everybody, if you'll bow your heads. Father, I know I have sin in my life. It separates me from you. Jesus died for that sin, that I might have a relationship with you, that I might have eternal life. Forgive me. Receive me. I surrender my life to you. Teach me how to live for you. I'm yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Every head bowed and every eye closed. If you just prayed that prayer and meant it with all your heart, I won't, I'm not going to embarrass you. I just want to know if you're here. I'm not going to have you stand up or do anything, actually. Just, this is it. You say, I just prayed that prayer for the first time. I asked Jesus to come in my heart. Would you lift your hand high in the air, wherever you are in the room? Would you? Anybody in this room, lift your hand. Yes, God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, gotcha. Anybody else? Just lift your hand real quick. Praise God. Yep, gotcha. Praise God. Thank you, and welcome into the kingdom of God. Let's all stand. I'm going to read these scriptures on the screen. You can look on the screen. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me in the same way also he took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes it's a memorial it's remembering we're saved Lord Jesus, thank you for your body. Thank you for your blood. Thank you for salvation. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for coming and giving us new life. We remember you until you come again. In Jesus' name, let's take together first of the bread and of the cup. Hallelujah. Praise God. I think, am I turning this over to Tyler? I'm all done, right? Lift both hands. Father, I send this amazing people out to a Memorial Day holiday. I pray they're filled with your spirit. I pray you'll bless them as they go out and bless them as they come in. I pray you'll be their shade in the sun. You'll be their protection in the wind. You'll guard them from every work of the enemy. Every strategy will be cut off. And they'll have a great weekend of liberty and freedom and blessing. But Lord, then we have the rest of the week and I send them out as laborers into the harvest. I send them out as warriors into the battle. And they're going out to have victory. Wherever they go, every place they put their foot, everywhere it treads, you're giving it to them. And they're going to be blessed beyond their wildest imaginations this week. Open their mouths to preach the gospel. Open their minds to hear your word. And may this be a week of great blessing and opportunity in Jesus' name. And everybody said, love you so much. Enjoy your holiday. See you next Sunday.